everybody for coming. Um, so yeah, I'll give you a little bit of background of how I got to where I am, because uh, it, it does influence some of the things I'm going to talk about. So I uh, was here. I, I did uh, EECS in uh, 2001, <coughs> um, a while ago. Uh, are there any freshmen uh, in the room? Because I like to say, uh, while you were being born, my soul left my body here at Soda Hall. Um, <laughs> so it's possible that we're intertwined in some kind of cosmic <laughs> way. Um, but uh, anyway, um, uh, I uh, come from a very traditional information security background, right? So I was uh, a bit of a teenage hacker uh, who never got caught doing anything um, with a 300 baud modem, uh, was here, did EECS, uh, was able to study a bit under uh, Dave Wagner, who was a grad student at the time. Um, and at the time, there was not a single undergraduate security class available to students. So there's like one graduate seminar in security and one graduate seminar in crypto uh, that I was able to take uh, with Dave. There were no professors teaching it. It had to be relied upon uh, grad students, him and, and Ian. Um, and uh, after that, I uh, worked for a couple of pure play security companies, started my own uh, company in 2004, sold in 2010. Since then, I, I've been the CISO of Yahoo and Facebook. Uh, a number of my friends call me the Forrest Gump of information security, because uh, whenever there's a massive international incident, I'm there in the back uh, playing ping pong. Um, <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, so I come from a very traditional technical information security background, right? of, of core information security, of the idea of people uh, subverting software to do things it's not supposed to do, to steal information, to break systems, uh, to, to you know, steal intellectual property. Uh, and yet I have found myself uh, the last couple of years being pulled into talking about kind of the geo-strategic uh, significance of these events um, and how governments are using the internet to cause harm uh, both to individuals and to societies overall. Um, which is a really weird place to be uh, based upon my background. I'm actually an adjunct professor of international relations. I've never taken an international relations class uh, at any collegiate level, um, which is an interesting experience. Uh, but like, it's, it's an odd thing, but it also demonstrates what has happened to our field, which is something that was kind of fun uh, in entertaining intellectually challenging back in the 80s and 90s has become one of these central pillars of national security for, for states uh, and for safety and trust and privacy for individuals. Um, and that's, that's a weird transition uh, that I expect those of you in the audience are going to go through the same transition in whatever you specialize in. Uh, it might seem like what you're doing right now is fun uh, and that stuff might turn out to, to be much more impactful uh, and dangerous uh, and risky uh, sometime in the future. So I thought I'd do right now is talk a little bit about you know, I know you've heard a lot about kind of some really specific uh, applications of, of big data technologies uh, and data science. What I want to talk about is a little bit bigger picture of some of the issues that are being faced by the massive consumer internet companies. Uh, and, you know, that there's a, a significant portion of this that has to do with the fact that they have accumulated exabytes and exabytes of data. Um, and also, they have a lot of problems for which machine learning has both been a curse and should hopefully be somewhat of a... a a solution going forward. Uh, and so I'll, I'll try to get through this and have a little bit more time, but I'm not going to get into all the technical details. Uh, but if you guys want to jump into more of that later, uh, I'm happy to. So the basic problem the companies are facing right now is that people don't like to make trade-offs. And this is just a natural uh, human instinct, right? But it, it is especially true right now in the internet space because while people don't like to make trade-offs, people also can't make trade-offs if they don't understand what they are. And what, what's, what's happening right now is that there's a, a small number of companies that are operating at multi-billion user scale. They're operating in over 100 legal uh, jurisdictions who have users with hundreds of different languages and cultural backgrounds. Um, and there is no precedent for who is responsible for deciding what those people are allowed to do, who is, uh, who is allowed to speak, who is a, a legitimate member of a society, who is the enforcer of cultural and legal norms, and how all these decisions are made, there's no precedent in human history for this kind of problem. You've never before had privately owned corporations acting uh, in this manner. Uh, with this level of responsibility and also without any kind of historical precedent. Um, and so as a result, you have a bunch of trade-offs that people don't understand. Um, and that's a, a real problem because if you don't understand the trade-off, then you, you can't make an intelligent decision. I'll give you some examples of that. So like kind of a traditional, very old engineering trade-off is the idea that you can have two of three things. You can have something done fast, correctly, or cheaply. 
right? Or if it comes to government contracting, you get zero of these three. That's one way to solve the triangle. Um, but for most engineering projects, this is kind of an axiom that we like to use in engineering, right? That you have to pick a point in this triangle in this optimization. Um, and you can you know, do a better job of making the triangle smaller through uh, better processes and better technology. But in the end, this is held true for all of human engineering since you know, somebody used a stick uh, to kill somebody else and somebody invented the wheel, right? Um, which I was just in the British Museum last week and they've got one of the first wheels there, which is pretty cool. Um, Anyway, I, I recommend you go look uh, all the stuff they've stolen from their empire. Um, it's a great museum. But anyway, this is a traditional engineering problem. So the, the optimization problem for if you are a consumer internet company of what decisions you should make to keep people safe, to keep them secure, to keep their data private, turns out to be much more complicated. And there's a bunch of equities that we would all agree are equities that are reasonable ones that we should aim for, right? Everybody believes uh, that uh, massive social platforms should be free of harassment of individuals. They also believe that you should collect minimal data on individuals. They, most people believe that you should have some level of integrity of the information you see, but they also want there to be some kind of neutrality in the moderation of deciding who gets to speak and, and who doesn't. Um, and it turns out you can't have all of these things, right? So for example, one of the big trade-offs uh, that has been the news in the last couple of years is the data portability trade-off, right? And so you don't want a situation where a small number of companies are monopolists and are able to lock out any kind of competition. Um, that it is impossible to build uh, any new applications because they have locked up all the users and that data is locked in. Um, but you also don't want data to leak out and be misused. Uh, and so for, in Facebook's example, um, Facebook decided it was going to allow people to build apps on their platform. Um, they're gonna open up an API that you as a user could opt in to the to a piece of software being able to impersonate you and to be able to access data programmatically with the same view rights that you have. This led to what scandal? Cambridge Analytica, right. Um, so what it was you know, supposed to be a decision that is anti-monopolistic, that is supposed to allow a large ecosystem to grow, turns out to also cause a data, portability, uh, a data leakage issue and that once you give people access to that data, uh, the ability to control what they do, especially in an API where anybody can sign up for it and you don't have like a strong legal gating function, turns out to be very, very difficult, actually impossible to figure out what people are gonna do on the backside with that data. Um, and so there are a bunch of trade-offs. Um, and the other problem here is that the trade-offs aren't actually linear. Um, when you move to one of these equities, you move away from other equities in a unpredictable and a nonlinear fashion. Um, so one really important one is minimal data collection. So effectively, if you want to police any kind of bad behavior on any kind of user-generated content platform, you have to know a lot about the people who are posting that data, right? And so if you move towards minimized data collection, then you move away from almost all of the safety uh, and integrity sides because you have to have data to be able to feed your algorithms to find the bad guys. Um, and so uh, one of the problems that the companies are facing is that this isn't understood, including by the companies themselves, right? Like this is a brand new area of human endeavor. We don't understand what the difficult engineering trade-offs are, and we have very few tools to actually describe them and then to, to decide how we want to handle them. Um, so there are a couple of things you can do, and one of the things you can do is just say, screw it, I'm not going to make the trade-offs anymore. I'm going to go all one direction, which is possibly a one interpretation of this post by Mark Zuckerberg. Um, I have no inside insight into it. I have to just read the post. I don't know what people are talking about internally. But if you read it, it does seem like a decision to move away from a bunch of these equities towards the minimized data collection um, and surveillance resistance. Uh, you know, you're going to move towards these two equities and away from a bunch of other ones. Uh, because trying to find a point in the middle means that at any moment, you can have a bunch of critics standing around you who are all criticizing you for not being all the way on one of those sides. So his decision is he's going to go all the way to one direction. I use the uh, metaphor of like, it's like a guitar amp, right? It goes from zero to 11. Um, and if you're measuring on the minimal data collection uh, to harassment free axis, you know, Facebook's been bouncing between three and seven and he's just decided, yep, we're going all the way this side. We're gonna encrypt everything. We're not gonna be responsible for moderating it. We can't see anything. We don't have any ability to help you. Uh, that's the decision we're making. So that's one way to do it. Uh, we'll see how that works out. Now, it, it doesn't mean that you, you know, this isn't a static thing, right? Like 
as engineering gets better, as we design better products, you can start to shrink the star and you can start to make the trade offs less stark.、Um, and I'll talk about some ways that I think that can happen. But right now, the trade offs are pretty stark here.、Um, and there's no good guidance of, of where we should choose.、Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of, like, kind of the fundamental challenges that companies face when they operate at the scale.、And、the first is the major tech companies are all acting in a quasi governmental manner, right?、So When I was a CISO of Facebook, I had an intelligence team. So I had a team of people whose entire job was to track the actions of state governments and their activities online, and then to intercede to protect the citizens of other governments. That is a unique time that a private company has had that responsibility, right? That is pretty unique. I had a child safety team, I had a counterterrorism team, right? Like, these are. Governmental responsibilities that have been taken by the companies by the fact that they own the platform, they own where the data is, and they have access to data and resources that the public sector does not.、Um, the companies all have people who decide what is acceptable political speech. They have people that decide what is acceptable advertising standards for people to run ads in democratic elections.、Uh, these are government decisions that should generally that are being made privately.、Um, they have effectively speech police, right?、Um, Uh, you know, I've, I've made the metaphor. It's people think that the ability to enforce、uh, content moderation rules is something that's super advanced, but it's more like the censorship DMV, right?、Um, that if you build any institution that has to operate at that scale with that many people,、um, with those restrictions on it, then you'll never be able to actually do that great of a job, right?、Um, and so the companies are acting like governments, but they don't have the legitimacy of governments. Right? They, have, they don't have the transparency. They've never been elected. People choose to use their products, but they can become so powerful that they are acting in a, at the same level as a government from a power perspective where people can't really choose to be free of the indirect impacts of that platform.、Um, and that causes a lot of problems. And then a related issue is while they are acting as their own governments, they are also responsive to the legal requirements of dozens and dozens of countries. Um, uh, and they want to build one product、uh, and they want to build one set of things that allow people to interact with each other no matter where they are,、uh, yet they have to follow all these different rules.、Um, and this expresses itself in a number of different ways.、Uh, historically, anybody know what, what, where this is, this location? I'll give you a hint. This is in 2011. So some of you were in junior high, I guess. It's Tahrir Square, yeah. You're laughing, but it's true, unfortunately. There's young people.、Uh, yeah, so this is t w i t t e r Square in Egypt.、Um, this is kind of the pinnacle of、uh, people in tech believing that what we were building was a, a fundamentally a liberation technology, right?、Um, and that、uh, we were building systems uh, that uh, were used to organize democracy protests throughout the Arab world for the first time ever, and that led to uprisings like this one in Egypt.、Um, at the time, people were very、uh, excited for. Uh, the fact that social media and the,、uh, really the ubiquity of cell phones. We talk about the social media companies, but the actual underlying technology here is that pocket supercomputers with always on connections have gone really cheap, right? And so the use of that are platforms that have been built by American companies, but there's actually a wide variety of companies that made that true that、uh, these devices can get so incredibly cheap、um, and that.、Uh, Even anywhere in the world, you end up with at least 3G coverage.、Um, and that is actually, I think, the fundamental technology shift here, whatever the, the technology on top. But anyway, 2011, people were feeling pretty, pretty good about the use of our technology to, to do things. There were some side effects.、Uh, the Tunisian government was injecting JavaScript into the login page for Facebook.、Um, there was a bunch of stuff going on of trying to intercept people's Gmail.、Um, and so there were changes that had to be made. Based upon the actions of governments during the、uh, Arab Spring.、Uh, but for the most part, it looked like this was going to be a positive outcome. This is what Trier Square looked like two years later. A little bit different, right? So, effectively, what happened is that a number of the governments that were overthrown in the Arab Spring, the next successor governments were no more democratic, were no more responsive to their citizens, but they were a lot smarter about the internet, right?、Um, they knew about the danger of the internet, and they also understood from Direct experience, they had come to power because of the internet, and they knew they could use the internet to sustain that power. And what we've seen since the Arab Spring is kind of the empire striking back, right? You've seen all of these governments. That's a movie for you young people、uh, from the 80s. Um, uh, what we've seen uh, is um, 
uh, these governments figure out uh, ways that they can use technology as an oppressive tool. Um, sometimes without having a lot of technological skill. So for example, in Egypt, uh, one of the things the government likes to do is they use the secret police to create personas online, <coughs> excuse me, and they will infiltrate groups of students who are chatting on platforms like WhatsApp. And all you have to do is infiltrate with one person and then groom one person to tell you what their, what their physical location is. And then you physically grab that person, you torture them, you make them log back into the social network, and then you have them set up all of their friends, right? So it doesn't take any technological sophistication. It is the application of classic Gestapo tactics to a knowledge of how social networks work online. Um, and that has been, unfortunately, incredibly effective in turning the internet into a tool of oppression, not just liberation. Um, and so one of the things, the challenges this brings up is all of the companies, if you ask them, will say, we respect local laws. Uh, that is something that you hear out of their lobbyists all the time, right? Is they say, we respect local laws. The truth is actually much more nuanced and that the companies are f constantly fighting requests from governments to do things they don't want to do and are resisting as much as possible, but are often doing so without kind of an overall framework of why they're resisting. And the challenge they're facing now is that as their resistance to legitimate democratic governments falls, it makes it harder for them to resist demands from the not so legitimate governments uh, or the autocratic governments. Um, and that's a, a, a serious problem that if you're going to act and have this quasi-governmental power, if that huge quasi-governmental power is now able to be subverted through legal means by every jurisdiction on the planet, um, then that turns out not to weaken states like people thought the internet would, but to significantly strengthen them, right? Because we're facing a future where these companies are effectively uh, the uh, right hands of a number of autocrats. Um, so that's a set of challenges. Another set of challenges the Valley is facing is you can't fix what you can't measure, and they're having real trouble measuring the bad things that happen online. So the good companies in Silicon Valley make all of their decisions based upon quantitative metrics. Right? So every time you use Instagram, every time you scroll through it, I was going to say Facebook because this group's too young uh, to be Facebook users. Uh, but there's, a, there's probably some Instagram users in here still. Um, every time you scroll through Instagram and you use it and you use certain features and you click on certain things, you are sending them information about what you like about that product. Right? You are, you are creating a, a trail that can then be combined with lots of different people in your demographic, demographic group that can then be used by product managers to decide this is how we're going to change the product. Now, there are companies that don't follow this model. Um, there's a competitor to Instagram that's doing really poorly right now. It's because that company, the CEO, just likes to make decisions about how the app works without getting data. And that turns out to be bad because that's only one person's idea. But companies like the, the Googles and the Facebooks and the, the Amazons, uh, those companies who have maintained their position on top of the pile have generally done so because they have leveraged the data they have to know what people want, right? But the downside is all of these metrics effectively boil down to one question, which is, do you like our product, right? That is what they are measuring. There's a lot of fine-grained numbers, but in the end, they're really measuring customer satisfaction. And the problem with customer satisfaction is it doesn't capture the totality of the impact of a product on society, right? So what's another product that has like super high customer satisfaction stores? Heroin, right? <laughs> so if you give somebody a shot of heroin into their vein and you ask them about 90 seconds later, are you satisfied with my product? The answer is invariably yes. Um, I know this because I lived in a co-op here uh, for a short period of time. <laughs> Um, on the north side. So, uh, right? Like heroin has really high customer satisfaction scores. But it is because then there are not metrics that are measuring all of the externalities to that immediate rush of customer satisfaction of the fact that heroin is bad for the user and in, in totality bad for society overall. And this is one of the challenges uh, the companies are facing, which is it is easy to measure, are people liking our products? Are they liking these features? Are they using it? It is super hard to measure, are we making people smarter? Are we making people actually happier, right? Um, are we making societies better? Are we increasing the quality of the information environment? Those things are spectacularly hard to measure. And if you can't measure it in Silicon Valley, you can't actually get it. Um, there's a, an axiom in all uh, of business, which is you get what you measure to the detriment of everything else, 
right? And this isn't just true in tech. This is in your entire business career. You realize the things that are measured, and especially bonus, are the things you will get. And you will, everything else that's not measured will get a little bit worse to get you that one number, right? And that is one of the fundamental problems that the companies don't have those numbers. Um, and that they're not measuring and bonusing people based upon them. And that makes steering these ships of tens of thousands of people very, very difficult. Um, and so one of the fundamental problems about measurement is you actually have to have definitions before you measure something. Um, and so one of the, there are many different ways that online services can be abused for harm, um, but one that has been talked about a lot uh, is misinformation, disinformation, especially from organized government actors. Um, these are two posts uh, from uh, an organization called the Russian Internet Research Agency. Um, you may read about them. They're a, a key character uh, in the Mueller report, which is this excellent free novel um, <laughs> that you can, uh, you can download. I actually have a paper copy. I don't have it with me. It's in my car. Um, it, it costs about 300 bucks to get it printed at Kinko's. Uh, but if you have a 12-year-old, it turns out that that's a great use of them uh, to, to hole punch 458 pages. Um, but anyway, um, these are posts by the Internet Research Agency. Um, uh, what the Internet Research Agency is is a private organization owned by uh, a man within uh, Vladimir Putin's inner circle, a man who's called Putin's chef because he actually owns a series of restaurants in Russia, um, a variety of other things too, as you can imagine. Um, and it is a private organization that is acting on behalf of Putin's political party and the interests of the Russian state with, with a very nebulous connection to the, directly to the, the Russian intelligences. Um, that's one of the things that was not well explained actually in the Mueller report that I was hoping to get more insight into. Um, what they have is they have uh, buildings in St. Petersburg that are full of disaffected, pissed off Russian millennials um, who speak a little bit of English, uh, who learn uh, better English and better uh, uh, language skills for a number of Western countries. Um, and it is organized into groups of people, uh, some of whom are, uh, are creators of media. So they have uh, graphic uh, design studios, basically, whose entire job it is to, to stamp out memes. Um, and then they have different teams whose job it is to infiltrate different parts of Western societies to drive division and chaos online. Um, so these are two posts uh, from the same organization, one on the left, one on the right. Um, and one of the key problems that we're facing as a society is neither one of these things is fake news, right? So you hear the term fake news a lot. It didn't mean anything even before Trump ruined it. Um, but it certainly doesn't mean anything now. Right now, fake news means stuff I don't like that I saw online, right? Um, uh, but uh, even before that, fake news was never even a term that we really tried to use inside of Facebook because it doesn't have a definition. Um, and the vast majority of the stuff the Russians have been pushing is not actually fake. It's either extreme political positions based upon true facts or it's non-falsifiable claims. So here on the left, um, this is a, a fake group called Blacktivists. So this is basically a fake Black Lives Matter group um, that had been set up that intentionally uh, was trying to uh, recruit uh, young African-American men mostly, uh, recruit them into these groups and to radicalize them. And their statement here is, Black Panthers were dismantled by US government. So you can see they, they dropped the the. There's all kinds of interesting little uh, things that like if you're, uh, when you talked, I'm not, a, I'm not a Russian speaker, but I had some Russian speakers on my team that are like, yes, this feels very like a, a direct transliteration of Russian. Um, black Panthers were dismantled by US government, again, no the, by US government because they were black men and women standing up for justice and equality. This is not really a falsifiable statement, right? This is a arguable statement within the Overton window of what you might argue in an African American studies class or an American history class. Right, like that you could have a number of people debate, is this true based upon facts that we all agree to? It is not fake news, but it is disinformation. And it's disinformation because while it's not falsifiable, it is being pushed by an organization that is lying about who they are, right? But so it's the identity of the speaker that is problematic here. It is not the content itself. Here in the Army of Jesus, you got this little cartoon about uh, Satan and Jesus arm wrestling over the US election. This is clearly parody, right? They are, not, they are not claiming that this is a actual photograph of what is happening right now between Jesus and Satan. Um, and it is very difficult to come up with a policy that says this is inappropriate without catching all kinds of intentional overstatement and parody that is extremely common uh, in our online lives. Uh, 
And so while these are disinformation, they're not fake news. And this leads to a lot of kind of uh, definitional problems about what are you trying to stop uh, when you stop this kind of activity online. Um, I, you know, I, I've got some more definitions, but like effectively it, it is a serious problem. And one of the parts of the trade off, hard parts of the trade off here is when you try to make those decisions, you have to think about when you write a rule that catches one of this, how much legitimate speech are you going to catch? If you're catching all ridiculous parody, that's a huge chunk of online speech uh, that you're all of a sudden going to outlaw, right? Um, and so the world would be a pretty boring place if we were only allowed to make like super specific uh, and uh, you know uh, cited facts that like everything we said was like a term paper, right? It had to have uh, you know APA standard citations for everything that you back up, right? Like that that gets rid of the whole idea of online discourse, which is a, a vulnerability that the Russians are trying to exploit. Okay, so let's talk, I've talked about a lot of the problems. We'll talk about some of the solutions that can be worked on. Um, so for you young people in the audience, this is a man named Bill Gates. Um, so before he was curing malaria, which is his job now, he was the founder and CEO of a company called Microsoft, uh, which used to make an operating system that young people used. Uh, now it's only used by old people like me. Um, uh, anyway, uh, but you know, you can buy a Windows machine with, with a keyboard that works. Uh, I know that sounds crazy. Um, <laughs> But anyway, uh, in the late 90s, Microsoft was in trouble on multiple fronts. One, they were considered a monopolist, right? And so this, these are actually still frames from Bill Gates' famous deposition that did not go extremely well um, uh, uh, about the, the uh, m monopolistic practices by Microsoft. But the other thing they're in trouble for was the fact that people believe that their software is really insecure. That turned out to be true, right? Late 90s, Microsoft software was crap. The truth, though, is all software was crap in the 90s, right? And, but Microsoft got most of the blame because they were the most important consumer software company. And so uh, their vulnerabilities were the ones that actually caused the most damage. So they're at, during this period of time, in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was a series of worms that had significant, you know, pieces of malware that had significant financial damage. NIMDA, Code Red, SQL Slammer. SQL Slammer shut down a bunch of ATM networks. Um, and so, you know, pieces of malware that weren't that technically advanced were able to do a huge amount of damage because Microsoft didn't know how to write secure code. Um, to Microsoft's credit, they figured this out. Uh, and in 2002, uh, Bill Gates wrote a famous email to everybody in Microsoft called the Trustworthy Computing Memo. Um, this is what email looked like uh, in 2002. Um, this is a piece of software called Windows XP. Uh, and, um, uh, in this email, he talked about how Microsoft had to change how they built software, and Microsoft actually lived up to what they wanted to do here. They stopped all software development at Microsoft for several months. They retrained all their engineers. They rebuilt their software development lifecycle. And effectively, in, over the next five years, Microsoft invented the, all of the techniques we know about now about how to build reasonably secure consumer software. There's a bunch of things that Microsoft did during this time that were like theoretical things, but were not part of normal practice. For example, fuzzing is a normal part of software development practice now. At the time, it was a crazy thing done by crazy kids at Black Hat, right? Um, the idea of bug bounties, uh, the idea of working with the online security community came out of this period of Microsoft, right? When Microsoft came to Black Hat 5, I believe, it was a huge shocking thing to have official representatives of a huge company be there to talk to hackers and not just to sue them. Right? And so there's this, this big period of time where Microsoft reinvented how they build software. And their software's not perfect now, but it's pretty darn good. And the other thing they did is that this was not their goal, but they uplifted the entire software industry because a bunch of people quit and then went to other companies and took what they knew. Right? So the core of the software security teams at places like Google and Amazon, a lot of those people actually came from Microsoft. In fact, the chief security officer of Apple, George Sathakopoulos, for a while the two of us were trying to take over that all of the CISOs would be Greeks, um, <laughs> which he's a real Greek from Greece. Guy chain smokes uh, like a chimney, makes me look like a wasp, right? Like the guy's truly, truly Greek. Um, anyway, George, was part of the Trustworthy Computing Initiative. He actually came out of Microsoft and he's helped Apple learn actually a number of software security lessons that Microsoft learned 15, 16 years ago. Um, and so that is what we need in our industry now uh, for a much broader set of issues. In this situation, it was, direct, it was information security. It was actually 
fully an issue that fell within the realm of computer science. For the most part, these issues did not have to do with sociology, with psychology, with humans. Most of these issues were just, are you building your software to be secure or not? Um, but now we're dealing with a whole set of issues that are intentionally cross-disciplinary. And we're going to need the industry to react in the same way Microsoft did back in those days um, to think about these issues a different way and to figure out how to build software in a way that is much more human and that considers all of the bad things that can happen when it's deployed in the field. Um, so some of the things I think the companies need to do. The first, for the companies that do the user-generated content stuff, so this is like Google with YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, obviously, a bunch of other companies. They need to start to embrace transparency um, and restraint when they make content moderation decisions. So one of the fundamental kind of problems they have when we talk about non-legitimacy of these quasi-governments is the companies don't explain their decision-making process. Um, so when you have an argument with somebody and you go into a court system, the argument is made in public. The decision of the judge is public. Other people can see how that case was decided and decide whether or not their case might go one way or another, right? That's a huge thing what you pay lawyers for is that lawyers understand all the precedent. And so when you come to a lawyer with a problem, they can tell you, this is what I think is going to happen. There is no lawyer that can tell you what they think is going to happen when your content is moderated by Facebook. Right? There's nobody can predict that because the decisions are all made in secret and they're made based upon a set of precedent that is constantly shifting based upon who's more angry at the company at any moment. Generally, the New York Times is the organization that is the most angry at Facebook, but sometimes there's other people uh, who are equally angry. And so you'll end up with like the shifting sands of decisions that are not explained publicly. Um, now, I'm not saying the companies should go write a, a decision every time they take down a single piece of spam. The truth is, is Facebook probably makes more content moderation decisions in one hour than the entire federal court system makes decisions in a year, right? They don't have the ability to sit and write seven pages on everything. But the big decisions, like a big one that has come up recently is, what is the definition of white supremacy? Like how much activity online, how many beliefs online fit within this nebulous term, white supremacy, um, that is a decision that they announced like just in a press release with a couple of paragraphs of, of, of PR person talk when really you could have seen six or seven pages of discussing the background of how this issue evolved, the kinds of um, arguments on both sides, what the decision was, and what the possible consequences of that decision might be, right? Um, the other thing I'd like to see them do is to be more subtle in their application of the rules to address the fact that not every part of these products have equal danger. So any online product is actually decomposed. You can decompose it into multiple products stacked on top of each other. And this is like a very simple decomposition of, of the Facebook product. And this is just Facebook, what we call the big blue app, not Instagram and WhatsApp and such. Um, of the different products that make up what people call Facebook. So at the top, we have the, the parts of the product that have the most amplification, the, the, the pr parts of the product that can take one person's speech and put it in front of a large number of people. At the bottom are things that have very little amplification. So at the top we have advertising, at the bottom we have one-on-one, -on -one, which I mean one-on-one -on -one messaging. Like you're in Facebook Messenger, you, you send a message to one person, you send a message to a small group of people, you have a personal a profile that's only seen by your friends, you have private groups, you have personal profiles that are set to public. Um, impersonal pages, so like the Blacktivist page, the Army of Jesus page, that's are these kinds of things. Um, and then the recommendation engines and advertising. And up here, the dangerous stuff. And then from my perspective, this is where you have, as you go down, more free expression concerns and honestly more creepiness concerns, right? So here is a creepy fact that we need to consider when we make these decisions. Almost everything you type online that other people see is being examined by machine learning that decides whether or not you're allowed to say that or not. Pretty much everything. Like we have, we thought that the AI future was going to be Skynet, like robots stepping on our skulls. That's from another 80s movie uh, called The Terminator. But it turns out the Skynet is not robots stepping on our skulls. It's a bunch of graphics cards uh, that are running machine learning models that are deciding whether our speech falls outside of the bounds of acceptable discourse or not. Now, a lot of those tests are the kinds of things that there's not really a political decision. There's a lot of scanning for spam. There's scanning for malware, right? A lot of that stuff none of us really object to. But as you go up the stack in most products, 
the further up you go, the more machine learning is making content decisions of what you say being appropriate or not. Um, and so as we look at this, what we've got to think about is at what level do we want to enforce these rules with the thought of, you know, sometimes we're going to have to let speech by that we don't like, but we can at least limit its impact um, while still respecting the rights of individuals. And the reasons advertising recommendation engines is bold is these two things are actually much more dangerous than this re reflects because they're the parts of these products that allow you to put content in front of people who didn't ask for it, right? So for all this other stuff, for the most part, people are voluntarily part of that conversation. They decided to join a private group. They decided to be part of a group message. If they're added to something they don't like, they hopefully can take themselves out of it or report that kind of spam. But for the most part, we're assuming that these people want to be part of this conversation. Where advertising by definition is people putting messages in front of you you didn't ask for. That's why they have to pay for it, because you don't like it, right? That's, like, that's how the whole system works. Um, and so what I would like to see is the companies be a lot more thoughtful about talking about their decision making process and drawing arrows to where on this triangle they're going to enforce certain rules. You're not allowed to send spam all the way at the bottom, right? Like spam has very little free expression concerns. Nobody likes it. We're going to scan for it everywhere. Certain kinds of exploitation of children all the way at the bottom. You know, it's creepy that the companies scan for it. So effectively, if you didn't know this, Every photo you have in every cloud hosting, every photo you've uploaded to every online site, every photo you've sent via Messenger has been scanned to see whether it is a known piece of what is called CSAM, child sexual abuse materials, which is the technical term for child pornography. Um, people don't say child pornography in the space because there's a big argument that you shouldn't call it pornography um, uh, because the victims did not uh, say that they want to be part of it. So we use the term CSAM or CSEI. I, I prefer CSAM because it's pronounceable. Um, Everything you upload is, is scanned for that uh, using a standard algorithm that's actually owned by Microsoft and then licensed out to all the other companies. Um, that is a decision that effectively the companies have made without any kind of legal guidance uh, because they know that that kind of activity is so incredibly harmful. But looking for, say, anti-vaxxers, right, where anti-vaccine people really drive me insane as the father of three children, the fact that they might come home with a disease that was featured in Little House on the Prairie really drives me insane, right? But that is part of living in a free society is sometimes people make shitty decisions that I don't like um, and they talk about that online. And so maybe you decide that somewhere around here is anti-vaxxers. Like anti-vaxxers can't advertise, they can't have big pages, but they're allowed to have private groups that they decide to be into and that you'll reduce the spread. Anyway, what I'd like to see is the companies where we make decisions like this, but they don't talk about it. And because they don't talk about it, there's very little legitimacy to the decisions and people don't accept them as being legitimate. Um, one place I'd like to see some technical innovation is on the safety uh, privacy frontier for end-to-end -end encrypted apps, right? So the example of applications where it is not true that machine learning is currently looking at everything you send is on the small number of apps that are actually end-to-end -end encrypted. So iMessage, WhatsApp, Telegram in certain circumstances, um, uh, uh, Vib Viber, I think, Line. Um, in those cases, that that uh, information is passing from one client to another without a computer telling you whether it's safe or not. Um, and I think there's a lot more innovation we can do here uh, on the machine learning space to push those kinds of decisions into the clients and to help people keep themselves safe. So there's really two kinds of abuse on these platforms. There's the class of abuse where the victim of the abuse that is, that is, that is uh, carrying the weight of the abuse is part of the conversation, right? Um, probably not, they didn't want to be part of it, but they are part of it and they can see the information itself, right? So if you're being bullied, if you're being sent threats to your life, people who are doxxed, uh, grooming of children, sextortion, uh, which is a horrible crime where you uh, convince people to give you nude photos and then you turn those nude photos into more nude photos, uh, into more nude photos. It's a, a horrible thing that happens a lot, actually. Um, recruiting of terrorists. This is the kind of stuff where uh, the you know, there are people who are participating in the conversation who don't want to, right? And therefore, those people can be given tools to breach the privacy of that conversation and to report it um, without having to breach the privacy of everybody's conversation. Um, and then there's a second class of issues, which are the class of issues where there's an external victim. So the trading of 
child uh, abuse materials. You know, the, the victims themselves, that material has been made a long time ago, possibly. The victims themselves are not part of it. The people who are part of those rings want to be part of those rings. Um, conspiracy, so if you have five people planning a terrorist attack all together, um, they probably all know each other already. Uh, and so they uh, are able to use it without one of them reporting it. Um, a lot of hate speech is among groups of people that are self-selecting, um, things like anti-vax, stuff like that. And so where we can especially see some innovation is on this side, where a lot of this stuff is right now on most platforms detected on the server side, on machine learning models that are running on those NVIDIA Teslas that are running on huge 64 core Xeon chips. Um, but as these things get more and more powerful, there's no reason why we can't pre-calculate these models in the cloud and do a lot of the actual detection on clients. And so what I'd like to see is some research in this area where people look into what of this stuff can we detect on the client, and then a situation where we detect with a reasonably high confidence that something bad is happening, can we then prompt the victim, hey, do you need help? This seems to be happening, please report this to us. And in the case of a person saying, I wanna report this conversation, you now unwrap the cryptography there, you're able to look at it, and you can kind of both keep the user safe without violating the privacy of all the non-violating conversations. On this side, much less technical stuff you can do without building back doors that are available for every uh, conversation. Um, so this means like better partnership with law enforcement and probably infiltration of these groups, which is the classic way of, of catching like child porn traders um, or terrorist groups is via infiltration. Um, one thing that the companies really need to work on is they need to think about how they synchronize their policies on hate speech. Um, and in my perspective, one of the things they need to think about is blockading certain sites. Um, so this is the post that the Christchurch shooter posted just minutes before he, he started his shooting rampage. Um, and in it, he talks about his motivation, obviously, um, but he also links to the Facebook live stream and he links to uh, his manifesto. Um, and in doing so, he created a situation where it was very, very difficult for anybody to block his thoughts afterwards because he, he was able to get first hundreds and then tens of thousands of people motivated to go post the stuff over and over and over again, sometimes manipulating the video. Um, it turns out that detection of video, fingerprinting the video actually is a computationally difficult problem. And there's very simple transforms that um, allow you to beat the detection mechanisms that are used by all the big companies. I'm not gonna talk about them, but these guys figured it out, unfortunately. Um, and so this site is a site, which I'm not even gonna name, but you guys can probably figure it out, but I don't like, I don't like it passing my lips, the name of the site. They intentionally try to host this kind of white supremacist and hateful content. Um, they do nothing to try to stop this kind of stuff. This is exactly the kind of site that you do not want young people to jump to from the legitimate sites. And so there is a internal, uh, there is a problem of radicalization internal to the big platforms, but what that path often leads people to is these kinds of sites where they could be truly radicalized with absolutely no limits, and in some cases, no information uh, that available to law enforcement afterwards to figure out uh, who was involved in the conspiracy. Um, and so what we probably need to see from the companies is a standard of sites that are doing this, they can't be taken down, right? But they don't have to be allowed to exist on the major sites. So you could effectively create a blockade where the five or six or seven major sites like this are not allowed to be linked to from Facebook, cannot be linked on Twitter, cannot be mentioned in a YouTube video. Um, and you can try to start to build a gap between the radicalization that happens on the platforms that actually do content moderation that they can't jump to these platforms where the truly hor horrendous stuff happens. Um, one thing the companies need to do is they need to enable academic research in this area. So the Cambridge Analytica scandal was really bad for academic researchers. Uh, from the company's perspective, they got screwed by an academic and they got blamed for it, right? Um, and so there is not a lot of interest at any of the big companies to open up their data for academic research. That is the wrong direction. We need to find ways that are reasonably privacy preserving where you can still research this kind of abuse. So one of like the basic problems is if Facebook goes and finds like a bunch of Russian troll activity, they take it down off of Facebook, right? They are legally required to delete that data under GDPR and FTC rules. They also then legally require any academics who had access via an API to delete that data. So it's very difficult to study a phenomena if all of your underlying data disappears the moment that it's found by a content moderator. 
right? And so that's the kind of stuff that the companies need to come together and say, these are some reasonable standards, and then go get blessed by a number of governments that these reasonable standards can be used without legal problems. Now, that turns out to be harder than you might think, um, but it's something that we need to start now if we're going to have any kind of reasonable research watching the 2020 election. Um, and then as the companies basically accept that they're going to be regulated and say, we want you to regulate us, um, to a certain extent, if you're a big company in any field, you want to be regulated because it increases the uh, compliance costs of all your little competitors, right? So uh, this is what's happened in the financial service industry, where a bunch of regulations have meant that the big banks get bigger and bigger and bigger because they can afford the lawyers, they can afford the compliance specialists. So we might see the same thing in tech. If you're going to accept regulation, then you have to do so under a defined human rights standard, right? And one of the problems we've got right now is you've got lots of situations going on um, where the same kind of terminology is being used by different governments in sometimes oppressive ways. Uh, and so a great example of that is this week in Sri Lanka, there's obviously a horrible bombing. And in the wake of that bombing, the Sri Lankan government shut down most social networking sites. And that was cheered by a bunch of journalists uh, and uh, media cr tech critics in the media in the United States. And then there was a little bit of a backlash of actual journalists and, uh, and NGOs in Sri Lanka who pointed out that the entire free press in Sri Lanka only exists online. That Sri Lanka has traditionally not had a free press and has had a government controlled press. And that this is not necessarily about keeping people from being violent, but about controlling the conversation of whether or not the Sri Lankan government has any responsibility um, and any culpability in, that, in failing to stop that attack. Right? And so this actually is a very difficult, subtle problem in that uh, a, a legitimate concern by governments can be also used in an illegitimate manner. And that's why we need the companies to, to say, if these laws are passed, we are going to follow the ones that follow certain human rights standards. And we will pull out of the countries where we're not able to do that. Um, the place where this is hardest is the People's Republic of China. Um, China is a massive ethical blind spot to Silicon Valley. All of our products are built there. A number of companies operate there uh, following the local law. Even though the companies know that their intellectual property is being sucked out through a straw, they still operate there because it's such a huge market for them. Um, and that has what is, honestly, the People's Republic has, is what has shifted this entire debate into a very dangerous direction. Because any, these companies know if they decide we're going to have a human rights standard, it is extremely hard to have any reasonable standard that you apply fairly that does not catch the PRC. Um, and that's, that's actually a real problem, and I'm not sure how we solve that one, uh, because a lot of the companies have dedicated themselves to the Chinese market uh, so far in a way that is hard for them to undo. Um, and so some other things that we might want to see in the US, um, I think we should have a, a federal privacy law. We have watched that rollout of a big privacy law in Europe called GDPR, the General Data Privacy Regulation. Um, there's two basic issues with GDPR that I think we can fix in the United States. The first is an easy one in the United States. Nobody knows what GDPR means in Europe because the law was passed at the pan-European level, but it's interpreted by 28 different data protection authorities and 28 different legal systems. And so we're going to have a decade of everybody suing each other and then of slowly those legal systems will converge as to a reasonable interpretation of GDPR. That's easy in the United States in that we have one federal court system that should converge much more quickly. Um, the other issue is more subtle, which is GDPR does not foresee the safety and security issues that are, arise from throwing away lots of data. Um, and this is also a structural thing in Europe where the European Commission, European Parliament have, have responsibility for privacy, but they don't have responsibility for national security. And so as a result, they pass these pro-privacy laws, but the, the, the request to stop terrorists, to stop Russian interference comes from the state level. Um, and so that's something we have to consider in our privacy law. Uh, I think we need to have a strength in Honest Ads Act. So since 2016, there's been no change to US election law to catch the Russian activity. So the vast majority of the Russian ads that were run in 2016 do not classify as what's called electioneering. Electioneering are the ads that are regulated by FICA. The vast majority of it is not electioneering because it doesn't say vote for Trump, don't vote for Clinton. It is talking about issues or it's talking about the candidates in a more kind of journalistic way. And that's not considered electioneering. So we need to extend the definition of, of that lower bounds on ad targeting, a bunch of technical stuff that I'd like to see for that. Um, 
We need cooperation and transparency between the companies. We also need to figure out who's responsible for this. And that's one of the issues we have in the United States is the defensive responsibility for this kind of work is super distributed across a bunch of different agencies. Um, and none of them really have the power to make the decisions necessary to protect the US from, from these kinds of attacks. Uh, and that's a legislative issue that needs to be uh, fixed out. We have hyper, hyper competent offensive people at NSA and Cyber Command. We don't have anybody with that equivalent competence on the defensive side. The closest we have is the FBI, but the FBI is cops, right? They are trained to watch something bad happen, take detailed notes, and arrest those people two years later, right? Which works for a lot of different kinds of crime, but is not what you want out of a defensive cybersecurity agency where you want to stop things from happening before the crime happens in the first place. Um, and that's kind of a, a basic issue we've got. Cool, so I've got some time for questions if you guys want to hit me on email later too. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, we, we will be wrapping up. I know it's 5.20 on the, uh, uh, on the session. Maybe we'll just take five minutes worth of questions. Sure. You okay, if everyone's all right with that. Okay, so, so the rule here with questions on, on this one is um, the first sentence of your question has to kind of end in a question. And there is no second sentence, okay? That's the rule. So um, see if we can try that. Wow. Oh, oh. Right, that was the second question. Okay. What do I think of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks? Wow, thanks, Mark, for the soft <laughs> opening pitch. Um, I, that is one of those areas where I have... I was of that group of people who thought, like, when WikiLeaks was dumping out, like, legitimate war crimes in the Iraq War, that that was a legitimate journalistic exercise. They started to lose me around... Um, the time of the Manning leaks, which were you know all of the cables of all of the embassies around the world, which ended up with people dying, right? Like you had, you ended up with people being arrested because their names were in um, uh, secret classified uh, communications between U.S. embassies and, and the State Department. Um, and I think clearly, I mean, Assange's time in his self-imposed exile radicalized him. By the time of the 2016 election, he was. If at a minimum, a useful idiot to the Russians, if possibly something more. I don't think he's like a full agent of the Russian intelligence because the Russians set up their own WikiLeaks called DC Leaks. They wouldn't do that if WikiLeaks was a completely reliable uh, uh, um, tool of theirs. Uh, but at that point, we're like, you know, there's not a lot of journal, you know, when you're both one, helping people break into systems, that is clearly not journalism anymore. Um, and two, when you are intentionally trying to manipulate the data that you're dropping in a way that is harmful to one politician, um, that starts to, to get to the point of where I get really uh, freaked out. So I'm not like, I think I'm glad they didn't arrest him for the actual data dump because it would be very hard to charge him on that and not catch a huge amount of legitimate journalism. Um, We'll see if he actually, I mean, the, the evidence on him helping Manning is very thin, so we'll see about that. Yeah. All right, let's go right here, and then we'll go across there. Yeah. Um, this is going to be a long-winded question. <laughs> one <laughs> sentence, so say it really it's fast. It's going to be one sentence. Okay, great. Oh. Given, given that the Mueller report identified the Russian organization, the IRA, as starting to display ads in 2014 to cause divide in America. Do you think that social media is gonna pay attention to that? Comma. <laughs> <laughs> and, and do something about it. So the companies have been doing a lot since 2016, right? So first off, effectively everything you've read in the Mueller report that, that is about activity on Facebook, my team found and turned over to the special counsel, right? So Mueller didn't find it, we found it. They have a bunch of other stuff, right, that they have from intelligence sources and such. And so they're able to tell the whole narrative. But for the, there's a lot of information in there that came from us, came from Google, came from Twitter. So the companies have already done a bunch of their own investigations. In fact, here's a side note. Our view of 2016 is massively distorted by the fact that we only know about Russian activity on platforms that have 
in-house intelligence teams that found that activity, right? There are thousands of user-generated content sites out there of any kind of size, but the vast majority of them can't afford to have ex-NSA Russian speakers go build machine learning models to go find Russian ads, right? And so I actually, one of the things I would like to study with the work we're doing at Stanford is I think if you cast a really broad net across not just the top three or four platforms, but a lo much larger group of platforms, you would find much more subtle activity that they're not catching because they don't have in-house teams doing it. Um, so the companies have done a lot around the advertising. Um, the companies have new definitions of political ads that catch the advocacy stuff. You have to verify who you are and there's a bunch of financial uh, verification that happens. Um, that's not gonna stop it necessarily. Uh, what we'll probably see is we'll see the use of Americans as tools. So you'll see Americans get tricked into running ads for Russians. Um, one of the things that came in the Mueller report that I couldn't really talk about before, um, but now it's out so I can, um, is the Internet Research Agency reached out to families of people killed in police shootings um, and then tried to get them to carry messages for them or to carry their messages on their behalf. So that's in the Mueller report. People That hasn't really been reported out, but it's right there in a footnote. Um, the GRU reached out and actually planted stories with US media outlets. So they, they are used to using Americans to carry their stories forward. There's a bunch of IRA activity where they would recruit thousands of people in these groups. They would say, let's have a rally, and then they would recruit an American on the ground to actually be the organizer, right? So I think we'll see that kind of stuff to get around the blocks that were put in place. The other issue is Google and Facebook have come up with those standards. There's about a thousand other companies in the ad ecosystem that have done nothing. And so if they want to run online ads, they can just choose from a variety of different other options. Um, and they can still do a bunch of organic stuff. So the companies are paying attention. The problem is, is if their OPSEC is good, if they're really good about covering their tracks, then it, it is very difficult to absolutely stop it. And I think the truth is, is in a free society, you can't stop, we can't stop our adversaries from injecting ideas, right? At a minimum, we allow their state media to operate here, right? Like Russia Today is available in basically every best Western across the United States. Go look at the list of places where you can get Russia Today. And there's a bunch of hotels. It's like all the places they have USA Todays on the front porch um, also have Russia Today on the TV. That, that can't be like an accidental decision by Russia Today on their distribution plan, right? And so we still allow their state media to operate because we're a free society. We don't punish journalists because we don't like who's backing them. And we don't like the things they say. That is true, going to be true online as well. While the companies will probably be better this time of catching the organized stuff, if they cover their tracks, they will still be able to inject. We effectively need to start to build an immune system against this, right? Like, we, we just can't assume that the companies plus the government are going to wipe this stuff out. We have to get to the point of where if they inject this kind of crap, it doesn't actually get as much traction. Because the other problem here is if you look at the stuff the Russians did, it's in many ways indiscernible from stuff that actual Americans said online too, right? And that's like the really scary part is that they weren't like inventing this out of whole cloth. What they were doing was finding the worst of America and trying to amplify it. Yeah. Let me take just one final question right there and then sorry, we'll, uh, we'll need to go to reception. Yes, please. How do social media companies overcome the difficulty of defining misinformation? Um, yeah, it's really hard. So a guy I hired at Facebook who's still there, his name is Nathaniel Gleitcher. He's a lawyer from the, he was at the Department of Justice. He worked in the Obama White House. Uh, he was working on a paper to define misinformation where he had like a five different axes. So he had like a five axis hypercube in which you would have to map any point of something that's disinformation. So like something, the actual thing you say can be untrue. You can have the untrue identity behind it. You can have, um, inauthentic amplification. So it could be a true fact, it could be a real person, but you could be trying to make it look like a lot of people agree with it who don't. So there's a bunch of different things. So the companies have these models, they haven't published them. So I would like to see that, honestly. Um, it is a huge challenge. It's a huge challenge. And, and then what, what ends up happening is one of the basic issues, um, if, you know, I'll just look real fast back. Um, if you look at that Russian content, Neither one of these pieces of content, if posted by an American who's not lying about who they are, is against Facebook's rules, right? It is okay to sign up for social media and to like one political candidate and not like the others. That is like a fundamental part of, of freedom of speech. Some people argue that it is, Facebook is going too far enforcing identity, right? Authenticity. Our country was actually formed by people who anonymously published leaflets, right? Um, now, uh, I, I am not, I don't believe that. 
but you know, this is, this is where this issue really runs into like fundamental American ideals of speech. And so from the company's perspective, this is tough because this content itself is, does not violate. And so you can't make a decision just by looking at this piece of content. What you have to do is figure out that blacktivist is actually run by the same people as the army of Jesus. And they're being insincere about who they are and they're manipulating people. And you have to have this kind of nebulous standard of like, if you're manipulating people in wide, then we will wipe out all your content, even if the specific content itself is okay. And that is something that we put in place after the 2016 election. That rule did not exist at Facebook before. We built it afterwards, but it's super hard to apply in practice. Um, and where this is really going to is the vast, I mean, we talked about Russian stuff. The vast majority of disinformation globally is domestic, right? So when you talk about people being manipulated online, the vast majority of time it's by their own government or their own political parties. It is not by foreign actors, um, which makes a lot of sense, right? Like. If you want to go manipulate somebody's democracy, you have to have people that speak that language. You have to have people that understand the culture. Who has more language speakers and cultural experts than the people themselves? Um, and so in places like India, there's a big disinformation problem. It is driven by the political parties themselves. Um, the BJP and the Congress party both have their own troll farms, like the Russians had a troll farm, but instead of aiming it against external groups, they're aiming it against their own citizens. Um, and that, that is, might be the future for the United States too, because this activity, if done by Americans and they're careful, is probably not illegal, right? Um, and that is what's scary. If you're a billionaire, you could build your own troll farm in the United States and troll people domestically, and you are protected by the First Amendment. And I think that's probably what we'll see in 2020, much more than the Russians. The playbook is out there. We'll see the playbook executed by Americans. And on anyway, that note, and on that uh, note, have a great day and uh, go Bears. Alex, thank you. <laughs>